Well, the birth of Jesus is a significant event, to say the least. And yet we find that it's recorded in only two of the four Gospels. His baptism, again, packed with significance. And the wilderness temptation that he faced when he squared off with the devil, that too is a significant event, but you find those recorded in three of the four Gospels. All of the miracles that Jesus did are significant in their own right, and all of them but one are documented only by a fraction of the Gospel authors. His death? All four. The crucifixion of Christ was missed by none. Now that fact indicates the significance of this event above all others. Aside perhaps of the resurrection itself, but his death is of utmost importance and we need to take a close look at it today lest we miss what God intended for you and I to catch. Jesus was meant to die. Lots of things happened that would not have had he not. Until Jesus dies, consider this. The costly ransom has yet to be paid. Until Jesus dies, the great conflict has yet to be won. Until Jesus dies, God's divine justice has yet to be satisfied. Until Jesus dies, the wage of sin has yet to be paid. The full glory of God has yet to be seen, and the work for which he had come from heaven to do at all is yet to be finished. Most importantly, and I would add this at the very tail end of that long line of significant detail there, unless Jesus dies, he can't resurrect. Death is the ultimate prerequisite there. We can celebrate his resurrection all we like, but we must remember that without him having died, the resurrection means very little, doesn't it? So let's understand as we get into this portion of Scripture that what we're dealing with here is perhaps one of, if not the most, important of all the things Jesus ever did. In verse 17, he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. <laughs> and these first three introductory verses here, I want us to understand very clearly. Please get this. Jesus is being pictured here for you and I as a condemned man, guilty of a high crime. Our opening verse tells us that he was carrying his cross, bearing his cross. Now, a man seen carrying a cross in the Roman Empire meant only one thing. Condemned. Crucifixion was a method of execution that was designed and often used, prolifically used by the Romans to kill criminals, condemned men and women. If you were a citizen anywhere near that procession and you saw what was going on, you didn't need to be told what was happening. The cross on the back of an individual said everything, condemned. And that's the opening scene. Jesus, condemned. The next verse tells us that if it wasn't enough for us to see the cross on his back, that he's propped up on a cross flanked by two criminals that were proven to be guilty, equally condemned. And Jesus at the center of it all. He's the centerpiece. So if you didn't get the first visual, perhaps you get it now. Furthermore, 
the third verse of our text, verse 19, tells us that the governor, Pontius Pilate, wrote the reason for his guilt on a placard and fixed it to the top of his cross above Jesus as he died. This is interesting here. The reason for Jesus' guilt was written down in every language necessary for everybody to read it. So there was no escaping the fact here that if you were a witness of these things, you go home with nothing more to conclude than that that guy was guilty. Everything in this scene so far indicates culpability. There is nothing to suggest innocence to any onlooker. Not you, not me, not them, nothing. Nothing says innocence. Everything says guilty. Would you agree? There's a guy carrying his cross. There he is on the cross, flanked by two other guilty individuals. And I can read for myself in my own language what the issue was. Nothing says innocence here. Now with that in mind, I want to ask you this morning, is it hard for you to see Jesus as guilty, even though you know he's not? Because you know he's not. He didn't do anything to deserve this. If ever there was an innocent man or woman, it was Jesus Christ. Never committed a single sin. Never said a single word against anybody that was in error. Everything he spoke was truth. Everything he did was transparent. Everything that he had ever done with his life was pure and righteous and holy, and yet there he is up there. He's guilty. Does that bother you? We're meant to see him this morning as guilty. Not until you're able to see Jesus as guilty in spite of the facts. I doubt that you'll ever be able to see yourself as innocent in spite of the facts. In God's economy, we need to get used to seeing somebody, not for who we think they are, but for who God has claimed them to be. Jesus Christ became sin, guilty, condemned. You need to see him as that. Your life depends on it. That, my friends, is, by definition, faith. <laughs> That's faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is assurance about what we do not see. Jesus isn't guilty. I can't see him as guilty. I don't see any guilt. You better start seeing him that way in faith. I'm not innocent. But in faith, I better start understanding that I am in God's economy if I've indeed been forgiven. Is that hard for you? To claim innocence for yourself? <laughs> I hope it is. I think it's meant to be. But are you able to do it in faith? Because that's the difference between heaven and hell right there. So this morning, God is inviting us to see innocent Jesus as guilty. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Both of those are equally difficult for my brain to wrap its silly little hands around. Jesus became sin that's so weird. Jesus, you sinner. Like, it, there's just something like wrong about that. But God made it happen. And then me, righteous? Like righteous like God is righteous? I have become the righteousness of God, pure and perfect and holy? There's something equally awkward about that. Especially for you, my pastor, pure and righteous and holy? Yeah, I'm with you. I don't get it. And yet, we believe this by faith or we have none at all. Go back to verse 18. 
I want to draw your attention to three words right there at the top of that verse. They crucified him. They crucified him. Three short words in the English language. They crucified him. In the original Greek, you'd only find two words. Very short, right? One personal pronoun and one verb. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie. I think it came out in 2004, Mel Gibson, A Passion. It took Mel Gibson nearly two years and roughly $30 million to convey the same thing that John did with just two words. They crucified him. <laughs> if you've ever read through the Bible, you can go to Matthew or you can go to Mark or Luke or John, whichever one you, you choose, and you will find that the gospel accounts of the crucifixion of Christ are surprisingly tame. Usually that's about all you're going to get. It'll mention the crown of thorns, it'll mention the whipping, but you're not going to get the gory details. You're not going to get the blood and the guts and all of the things that I guess God deems extraneous. Those details weren't needed. If you want to know what a crucifixion was like, don't read the Bible because it won't tell you. If you want to know what a crucifixion is like, and many people already know, because they've dug into history. That's where you're going to have to look for the details of what a Roman crucifixion entailed. Because our Bible says this, they crucified him. John's emphasis here, much like the other gospel authors, is not on the pain Jesus endured. John's emphasis is on the prophecies he fulfilled. That's what's important. Not how much blood loss there was or whether the bowels were hanging out or whether, you know, what does that matter? The prophecies being fulfilled is what matters. That's why John brings it up in verse 24 that prophecy was fulfilled and in verse 28 and in verse 36 and in verse 37 because that's the point. If your life was a gospel, that you were entrusted to write. When you got to the hard chapters of your life, let me ask you this. Would you fill up the pages with all kinds of frivolous details about how bad it hurt and how hard it was? Or would you faithfully point people to what's really important? You might be able to answer that question right now, even though your life isn't necessarily a gospel that you're writing. I can ask you this. Are you careful in difficult times to help people see how God is able to accomplish beautiful things through your painful circumstances, or do you just focus on the pain itself? Woe is me, I'm having such a hard time. And Because these gospel writers and Jesus himself are helping us to see God more clearly. That's why the details of the pain and the gruesome nature, the, the graphic depictions, it's all left out. We saved that for Mel Gibson movies. You would never have known it was that graphic had you simply read the Bible, which is why so many Christians, when that movie came out, squawked about how terrible it was, just too gory. Yeah, that's because you've been reading your Bible. Gore isn't conveyed in the scriptures. It doesn't need to be. Of course, we don't need to pretend that it wasn't there because it certainly was, but that wasn't the point. So I love this. Now, Pontius Pilate writes, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, <laughs> on this, you know, sign, posts it to the cross above Christ's head. And then a bunch of the Jews, they read this, and they complain. They said, no, don't write that. Don't write the king of the Jews. Write, he said he was the king of the Jews. And of course, Pilate fires back and says, what I've written, I've written. Like, I ain't changing it. You guys have been bossing me around for too long now. I've, I'm done. So finally, he gets a spine. Just a few verses too late, but he... So there it is. Jesus is the king. Clearly stated in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. So it was printed in enough languages that everybody there would get the message, whether they were Jewish or Greek or Roman. 
the message was clear. I find this insightful. Uh, what I learn from these few verses is that the truth of Christ has been being translated into foreign languages since the very hour of his death. That's kind of neat. And Christians have been carrying on that work for the last two millennia. Doing what must be done to translate the truth of Christ into as many languages as possible so that everybody has a chance to see that Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king. Before any of the gospels had been composed, because when Pilate wrote that down, Matthew had yet to write his account. John had yet to write his account. Luke had done none of his research to compile and edit his own manuscript. Mark hadn't gotten, none of the Gospels were yet written, let alone in print. This happened before the Gospels were written. This happened before any of the epistles had been penned. But before any of that, there was this. Jesus is the King. And that, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to skip reading the New Testament, because you just too lazy. Jesus is the king. That's a summary statement of all that would eventually be printed in all 27 books of the New Testament. You want a really, really, really short synopsis? Jesus is the king. And it's interesting to me that Pontius Pilate, of all people, <laughs> just basically put the world's first New Testament into print. There you go. Jesus is the king. Well, ever since then, we have translated that fact into over 2,214 additional languages. <clears throat> and it all started here. And they didn't like the translation. Uh, the translation's not the problem. It's the heart that's reading it that's the problem. I run into this issue so many times with people who want to gripe to me about translations, and they want to arm wrestle over which one's the best and which ones are from Satan. It's like, come on. Hey, listen, pick up a Bible with 66 books in it and get reading. I don't care what translation it is. You'll do okay. If you do it with the right heart. But some people simply cannot be appeased. There's no translation in the world that's good enough for people who hate the message. Jesus is the king. I don't like the message. Therefore, I don't like... Come on now. And I'll tell you this. The closer your interpretation of Christ is to the truth, the more people are going to... maybe even violently disagree with your interpretation. Well, that's your interpretation. I don't really believe that, but okay for you. No, that is the interpretation. There's only one. Jesus is the king. What, are you going to misinterpret that? I don't care if you're Jewish, and I don't care if you're Greek, and I don't care if you're Roman. Jesus is the king. Well, the problem they had with it, ultimately, was that Pilate, what he wrote, he presented it as fact. So they wanted the vernacular to be altered to suggest that it was a little less sort of uh, fewer implications on me than what that says. And isn't that what we're all doing when it comes to the Bible? We wish we could read a Bible that had very little implication on us. You know, let me just read it like history. Let me just read it like entertainment. Let me just kind of see what it says. I'm curious. But then when it says stuff like, you know, if you don't believe in Christ, you're condemned to hell for eternity. And we're like, well, I don't know if it, what real, hell, I don't think it really means hell. Like, or I don't think it means forever. I think it's just kind of, that's how I think. No, it says if you don't believe in Christ as the only true way of salvation, then you'll go to hell forever. What's written is written. Like, you can argue translations all day. 
you can argue interpretation all day. At the end of the day, if what's written is right, if it's fact, then it doesn't really matter what we believe, does it? Well, they didn't like the translation. Generally speaking, you'll find this to be true. The more vocal you are about Jesus Christ and the more factual you grow to be, you'll find it to be true that unbelievers don't really have a problem with you believing whatever you want about Jesus until you begin believing that what you believe is to be true of Christ is to be true for everybody else also, whether they deny it or not, whether they believe it or not. It's like gravity. Nobody believes in gravity, but all of a sudden I believe in gravity. And I also believe that what I believe about gravity is right, and that gravity also applies to you, even if you don't think gravity applies to you. You're going you're gonna to learn the hard way on this one? You're going to force yourself to endure the bumps and bruises of pretending gravity doesn't exist when it does? and you're going to reject it just because you don't like my interpretation of gravity? Moving on in verse 23, we're told that the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they made four parts. So they take his garments, they divvy up the clothing. Each soldier gets a quarter. Also the tunic. It was without seam, and they gambled for it. Now, here's what's interesting. I, I want to say something here in passing. Uh, when we're told that they took his garments, now you can take this for what it's worth. Um, I believe that Jesus was naked. I believe that Jesus was stark naked here. And I think that this would be most appropriate to make comment on it at this point in the gospel because it says that they took his garments. I mean, come on, there is at least more evidence to suggest that he was naked than there is to suggest that he still had on a loincloth. And let me remind you that the first Adam in the garden, when he became a sinner, the very next thing that happened to him, if you remember, was that he was made aware of his nakedness, total nakedness. I believe the same thing is happening here to Jesus as Jesus becomes sin. He's made naked before everybody. And I'll tell you this. The Romans would have wasted no opportunity to humiliate their victims or to horrify their audience. And the Jews, hating Jesus like they did, would have made no attempt to stop them. And I believe this was a prime opportunity. Let's strip him buck naked in front of everybody. Now, it may be opinion, but I think is my, I believe that mine is a little bit more valid than what I've seen depicted. I think he was naked. Now, you go ahead and let that picture sink in. Jesus embarrassingly naked hanging there, looking more of a fool than what any Renaissance artist had ever depicted in the past. I think some of those artists had more interest in modesty than they had in accuracy, which is why you'll find that Jesus is always clothed. My Bible says that he wasn't. They took it all away. And also the tunic. Now, what's up with this tunic? Well, that this garment, whatever it was, had considerable value is made pretty clear by the fact that they refused to tear it. They needed to keep it whole. This is really the prized possession of everything that Jesus had, which, by the way, wasn't very much at all. Jesus did not have much to divvy up. <laughs> but what he did have, namely this tunic, was of significant value, at least to some people. Who gets to keep the robe? Well, we don't know who got to keep the robe, but we do know how they got it. 
They got it by rolling the dice. That's what it means to cast lots. They rolled the dice. Imagine that as a souvenir. Imagine anything of Jesus's as a souvenir. You know? Like, what if you got his sandals? Would you sell them on eBay? I hope not. Would you wear them? How dare you? Thinking that you could walk even a mile in his shoes. Now, who gets to keep the robe? There's great symbolism here, guys. In the Bible, righteousness is compared to a robe. In Isaiah 61, verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Now, the Bible goes on to explain how faithful men and women are promised to be given such a garment as this. In Revelation 19, it says, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Our righteousness is the very righteousness of Christ. It's as if he gives us that robe, and it's not just any robe, it's his robe that we will wear for all of eternity. Jesus is our righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, Jesus becomes our righteousness. He doesn't give it to us. He is it, and we wear his garment. Now, the difference between us and those soldiers is that we, unlike them, don't acquire this garment by luck. We don't need to roll the dice to see if we get to keep that robe of righteousness. We receive that by faith. And thank God it's not limited to one lucky winner either. <laughs> this robe of righteousness is available to all through Christ, anyone who will come. Anyone who has faith in Jesus will be given this fine white linen with which to be clothed and that is Jesus himself who becomes our righteousness. There's deep symbolism in this, and I'll leave it aside for now. Now in verse 25, it tells us <clears throat> that there stood by the cross Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus gives his focus to his own mother, and the disciple whom he loved, which is an indirect reference that the Apostle John, the author of this gospel, is making to himself. Too much humility to put his own name into the writing, so he's letting us know that it was him without being overt. So Jesus now, stark naked, whipped bloody, at the worst time in his life, is hanging from the cross, and still shows concern for how other people are going to get along without him once he's gone. Somebody needs to take care of my mom. And he sees John there. And he says to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. Now you might look at that and go, I don't even know what that means. They understood what it means. The very next line says that from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. He, understand, he understood that he was being entrusted with the responsibility to be caregiver to Jesus' mother until she was dead. She was no doubt widowed at this point. We don't know what happened to her husband, Joseph, but he is out of the picture. And her care is being entrusted to a different man, one that Jesus himself could trust. And the responsibility is being accepted here. What's interesting about this is that Jesus calls her woman, even though in this passage she's referred to as his mother twice, Jesus himself doesn't refer to her as mother any longer. He calls her woman. Now we might read that and go, well, that's disrespectful. You know, woman. It's not how he said it. <laughs> Jesus meant no disrespect by using that term, I assure you. On the contrary, I think that out of respect, Jesus is helping his mother 
to see that the dynamic of their relationship needs to change. He no longer refers to her as mother but woman. Now why is that? Because until now, according to her understanding, she, as his mother, had authority over him. She had given her life for him. She had provided for him. But now, <laughs> now he is claiming authority over her. He was now giving his life for her. And he, in verse 27, was already providing for her. She needed to know that. And he was helping her come to that understanding. It was imperative right here for Mary to let go of her long-held perception of Jesus. This has to happen. Not because it was inaccurate. He was her son, but because it was narrow. He was more than her son. And she needed to get it. Jesus was always meant to be more than a son to her. He was meant to be her savior. And Jesus had been helping his mother come to this realization since the very beginning of his public ministry three and a half years ago. If you remember in John chapter 2, he referred to her as mother back when he turned water into wine. You remember that? They run out of wine. She's freaked out. Jesus, they're out of wine. He's like, woman? <laughs> He's been tenderly and patiently helping her transition in her own mind in the relationship, the regard that she has for this man. Less of a son, more of a savior. You've got to get there, Mary. And sometimes, guys, it takes a while for a person to grow in their understanding of Jesus. Do you know that? You should all be, we should all together collectively, yes and amen. It takes a while sometimes to grow in your understanding of Jesus, or maybe I should word it this way. It's hard for people to let go of their assumptions of Jesus. That's hard too sometimes, isn't it? But Jesus expects that we change in our perceptions of him, that we let go eventually of who you've understood him for so long to be, let who he is develop to you. So how long has it been since you advanced in your comprehension of who Jesus really is? Or do you still think he's the same old guy you were introduced to three and a half years plus ago? See, I think a lot of people come to Christ and they really enjoy that, that he was 100% man. They can really relate to him on the human level. They like that he walked among us and suffered like we did and faced all the same temptations that we face because I can relate to that. But you have to grow in your understanding beyond his physical relationship to you. Mary needed to. She needed to advance her understanding of who Jesus really was or her enjoyment of having him in her life at all ends right here. Because her son is about to die. The only way for this relationship to continue in advance and to grow is if she shifts in her perception to see him as Savior. That's a relationship that'll never end. Jesus might be expecting the same thing from you. You need to grow in your understanding of who he is in relation to you. So after all that was done, okay, <laughs> Jesus is like, Mom, uh, John needs to take care of you. John, take care of Mom. Okay, now that that's finished, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he had done everything he needed to do in order now to exit this life except for one last thing. There was one scripture left to be fulfilled. There was one verse in Psalm 69 that had yet reached its prophetic conclusion, and it was that he expressed thirst. That's all he's got to do. Then he's done. All you got to do now is, Jesus, you have perfect score right now. One thing left on the test. Final answer. What do you got to do? I thirst. This is it. 
the culmination of three and a half years, dare I say, 33 years in this life, in this body, culminated in one final act. I thirst. So they filled a sponge with sour wine and they put it to his mouth. Please understand that the thirst Jesus is feeling right here is severe. Severe. If you are able to recall the time in your life in which you felt greatest thirst, if you could calculate that by perhaps a billion, right? I may or may not be exaggerating here. He's thirsty, severely thirsty. This is severe blood loss thirsty, which any research in the field of biology would tell you that when a patient loses vast amounts of blood, there is a thirst that's produced. Jesus had that, I assure you. This is not only severe blood loss thirst, this is post-wrath of God thirst. This is after the three hours of darkness in which the wrath of God was poured out on him. Not just the wrath of God directed toward one sinful individual, but the wrath of God cumulatively for all sinful individuals, past, present, and future. This is post-wrath thirst. Additionally, this is having just endured hell thirst. Jesus, in some sense, had endured eternal hell on behalf of any and all who would ever be spared of eternal hell. And from what I hear, hell is hot. And from what I'm here, the people in hell are really thirsty. In Luke, I believe, chapter 16, I read of a man who was in hell who begged that somebody could simply dip their finger in water and hold it to his tongue because one drop of cool water in hell is more desirable than any other thing other than to get out of there. So, Jesus is thirsty. That's why... He said, I'm thirsty because he's not a liar. Now, whether sour wine is able to quench a thirst like this, I doubt. <laughs> now, you find when you're really thirsty, there's only a few things on the planet that really work. Water is one of them. Maybe Mountain Dew. I don't know, some of you guys. You ever try to quench it with milk? It's like, I don't know, kind of? <laughs> I'm not sure what to think about that. Ooh. Uh, your coffee, hot coffee, that'll really, you know, uh, water, water would do it. Sour wine, um, I'm just going to go no on that one. Is that fair? Okay. So whether sour wine is able to quench a thirst, especially like that one, I'm going to doubt that. Um, how much liquid can actually fit into a sponge you know, you're dying of thirst. You want like, you know, 64-ounce Big Slam kind of couple, yeah, a sponge. You try to suck out, I don't know. How much Jesus would actually be willing to drink from a sponge like that? I don't know. And if you don't know what I'm referring to, I've recently learned that the sponges that would have been accessible at that time would have been the sponges that soldiers had with them as a, an element uh, to be used in the latrine. The sponges with which they would cleanse themselves after having relieved themselves. You following me here? Well, I don't know. There's all kinds of details, I suppose, that you can take into account to, to, into account to determine whether Jesus drank enough to actually quench his thirst. I'm going to say probably not. Probably not. I don't think his thirst was quenched. I think he was thirsty on the cross, and I think that Jesus died a thirsty man. And I believe that there is strong evidence to support that conclusion. I believe Jesus died thirsty so that we could drink. I believe Jesus did drink, but it wasn't from the sponge so much as it was the cup that God gave him full of wrath. I think that Jesus drank the cup of wrath so that we could drink 
the living water of eternal life and never thirst again. I think that Jesus denied the quenching of his own thirst so that we could quench ours on what really counts. They offered him a sponge full of sour wine. Well, isn't that nice? You know, I don't know if it was done in spite. I don't know if it was done in sympathy. But I will tell you this. Whatever it is that mere men are able to offer you by way of religion is bathroom tissue soaked in sour wine compared to what Jesus offers us in himself. Fair? Man-made religion by itself has never quenched anybody's spiritual thirst, not once. Religion alone can never quench a person's thirst for righteousness. Being thirsty is a good thing. Thirsty for righteousness. Jesus said, blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. Be careful, however, where you attempt to quench that thirst. I would go on to say, cursed are those who think that the religious concoctions of ignorant men can quench it. You need Christ. You need Christ. Not a formulaic prayer, not the right church, not some traditions or some rituals or some of this or some of that. You need Jesus Christ. It's why he died thirsty so that we could be quenched on him. Jesus died of thirst so that we wouldn't have to drink from that sick, sour sponge of religion that men are glad to offer anybody. The living water is found exclusively in Christ. When he had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. In the original language, this is not three words. This is one word. It's as if Jesus said, Done! Done! Now, I'll tell you this, what I'm reading into Scripture here is that this statement wasn't the helpless cry of relief that this was finally over. It's done. Oh, no. This was an authoritative decree. Done. Whether he said it loud or whispered quietly, I don't know. Volume at this point doesn't matter. It's done. Done. Jesus, in this statement, is laying every argument to rest. That's what the word means. That's what this phrase, that's what this statement indicates. He's laying every argument to rest. We don't get to argue with him anymore. It's done. What's been written has been written. He was bringing the entire message of his life to closure. It's finished. One commentary says this, everything had been done that the law of God required. All things had been established which prophecy predicted. All things had been brought to pass which the Old Testament types foreshadowed. All things had been accomplished which the Father had given Jesus to do. All things had been performed which were needed for our redemption. Nothing was left wanting. Nothing. The costly ransom was given. The great conflict had been endured. Sin's wages were paid. And divine justice was satisfied. Man. Never ever has God accomplished as much as he did through a travesty as great as this was. Truly, I think that we have in plain view a fulfillment of what Paul said in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who are called and love him. And that would be Christ, of course. God uses the murder of his only beloved child to save the despicable men and women whose sins were responsible for it. And that, of course, includes me and you.
And he wrote it down in plain English for you and I to read. And you might not like the translation. You might not like the interpretation. You might not like the implications. But what's written has been written. Jesus wasn't guilty. We are. <laughs> and I certainly hope you know that, and I think that you do. And yet Jesus volunteered himself to be judged as guilty so that we would have the chance to be judged as innocent. And that's what he did. It didn't matter that he was innocent. God wanted Jesus to die as a guilty man, so Jesus did, and he did it well. It's what God wanted. I'm innocent, but if you want me to play the guilty game, I'll play that guilty game. Give me a cross to bear. Write a placard above my head. Lift me up between two additional condemned criminals and let me die. You want me to pretend like I'm guilty? No problem, God, I love you. And by the way, when Jesus declared his own work to be finished, he put the ball in your court because yours isn't. He played the part of a guilty man, and he did it well. And he finished his job and then threw it right back at you for you now to play your part. And if you have faith in Jesus, it doesn't matter how guilty you are or how guilty you may feel. God wants you to live your life as if you've been forgiven. And he wants you to do it well. If Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, can play the part of a criminal, then can you play the part of a son? or a daughter, and can you do it well? <laughs> well, our part doesn't require as much bravery as Jesus did, <laughs> but it will include love. Jesus died for love of God. And if you're going to play your part, You'll do it for love or you won't do it at all. This morning, dear God, we come before you with, I pray, a greater understanding of what took place on the cross that Jesus was hung upon. My hope this morning, Lord, is that we will then, having perhaps understood the part he played, begin to see in ourselves a greater responsibility and I hope a greater desire to play our part well. He played criminal and endured murder so that we could play the part of innocent and enjoy life. We praise Jesus this morning that he was willing to die thirsty because he has, Lord, may we come boldly before the throne of grace and drink freely of the living water that you've offered us to drink. May we enjoy what Jesus bought for us, the good gift that he's given to us. May we utilize that gift to the greatest of your glory, to the fullest of its potential, not squandering the preciousness of what has been so amply supplied at such great a cost as redemption. I don't know how we feel this morning. Maybe we feel guilty. Maybe we feel inadequate. Maybe we feel condemned. Well, then maybe we need to check our faith. Maybe there's a reason for that. 
But if indeed we have placed our trust in Christ, if indeed we are born again, if indeed Jesus' blood has paid for our redemption, then we better start acting like it. We have no excuse to not act like Christians. If Jesus can act like a guilty, condemned criminal, then certainly he can give us the power that is needed to act like we should. May we, Lord, always and forever.